focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have our Tuesday reporters, Kwon Zhua and Che Ji-hee joins us. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. All right, uh, we are going to start things off uh, with some economy-related news here, something that we've been covering for quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of upset people here in South Korea, let's just put it at that. Uh, the South Korean government accelerating its all-out war against the United States uh, to solve the issue related to Washington's enforcement of its Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we Again, a lot of us are very upset with this uh, IRA. Uh, the act apparently excludes, again, uh, automobiles manufactured in Korea from receiving subsidies from the United States, uh, U.S. government, despite the fact that we do have a free trade agreement with the U.S. G. you're going to start us off. Uh, what do you have on the latest here? Right. So the South Korean government is increasing its level of pressure on the U.S. by promoting the early operation of the bilateral consultative body between the two allies and seeking cooperation with other countries facing the same uh, situation as South Korea regarding this act. Now, while the fundamental solution to the matter is a revision of this newly enacted law, it seems that it will be difficult to resolve the issue in the short term as President Joe Biden and the Democratic Party ahead of the midterm elections in November uh, are putting forward the IRA as their greatest legislative achievement. Meanwhile, South Korean Trade Minister An dok arrived in the U.S. on Monday for talks on the act that excludes electric vehicles assembled outside North America from tax incentives. And Anne emphasized that the new U.S. law, which offers up to 7,500 U.S. dollars of tax credit only to EVs using U.S.-made batteries and core minerals, violates the Korea-U.S. trade agreement and the international trade norms set by the World Trade Organization. Now, the Korea-U.S. FTA promises the equal treatment of products from each other as domestic goods or those from countries with the most favored nation trade status. And said, uh, quote unquote, in case the revision takes time, the Korean government will seek various measures by the U.S. administration that can offset the effects of this act. Uh, He also noted that he's set to meet U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai, as well as other government and congressional leaders during his three day visit to Washington. Now, he said he assumes Representative Tai also recognizes the severity of this matter and the government uh, consultative channel will go into operation as soon as possible. It seems that Anne will also form a separate consultative body consisting of other related institutions. And so regarding this, a government official noted that the formation of a separate consultative body would hold a symbolic meaning that the U.S. government would like to be actively involved in solving this matter. Uh, Industry Minister Yi Chang-yang is also scheduled to visit the U.S. later this month to meet his U.S. counterparts on ways to minimize the negative impact of the U.S. law. And the matter is expected to be discussed during a Korea-U.S. summit forecast to be held when President Biden takes part in the U.N. General Assembly to be held from the 19th to the 20th. Uh, The government strongly expressed concerns regarding the matter during the trilateral meeting among the security advisors of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan held a week ago as well. And other than that, uh, multilateral working level consultations have also been carried out with EU states that face the same situation as South Korea as part of the government's efforts to resolve this issue. Look, you can't go around uh, saying, listen, South Korea, uh, let's have a nice alliance here with uh, Thailand. Taiwan and Japan to have this chip for alliance here because, uh, you know, we all need the chips, you know, semiconductor chips. And they're, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we're going to pass this thing called the IRA. And uh, it's a me, me, me. Because the chip for already sounds like a me, me, me thing mm. for the United States. But I kind of understand where Joe Biden is coming from. He's doing this whole America first. But it's America first. Yes, but we're also going to take your stuff and then say America first. Uh, one of the uh, things that I think kind of uh, upset a lot of people uh, yes, what was it? Uh, it was Labor Day yesterday in the United States, and so I think President Joe Biden was in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, talking to some of the labor unions there, and basically came out saying that, look, you know why I, I had a chance to talk to uh, South Korean business leaders, and they said they want to invest in the United States because we have a great workforce and uh, we have a, uh, a safe environment, is what he said. But right now, it just seems like you're forcing a lot of these uh, Korean companies to invest in, in the United States, as in 
make your plants here or else you're not going to get any subsidies, right? And we're not going to be taking any of these cars that are being built in, in, in South Korea uh, and said, build it here so we could take everything. It, it's very upsetting, I think, when the UN administration has been doing all they can to improve ties with the United States. Uh, all this going on right now, the Korean won tumbling even more. I feel like we're seeing this on a daily basis right now. Uh, more than 13-year low again against the greenback. Uh, although things seem to look a bit different earlier in days, uh, earlier in the day. So, so I fill us in on the latest figures here. Right, the local currency traded at 1,371.71 against the U.S. dollar, down 0.31 from yesterday's close, marking yet another low. In fact, it's the lowest figure since April 1st, 2009, or 13 years and five months. So, during the financial crisis, uh, it ended at 1,379.151 back then. Now, the dollar continues to grow strong amid expectations the U.S. Federal Reserve will likely raise the benchmark interest rate another time this month, and that by 0.75 percentage points. Uh, the one started off, though, at 1,369.1, down 2.41 from the previous session's close, and it also hit 1,364.41 at one time. And this is attributed to the Chinese yuan that grew stronger uh, after on Monday the People's Bank of China announced it would cut the foreign exchange reserve requirement ratio or RRR in a bid to improve uh, the ability of financial institutions to use foreign exchange funds. And uh, the Korean won has been showing a coupled movement with the yuan recently. So that's uh, why the day started off a little different. But in the end, uh, the won again sharply lost ground against the greenback. So the effects of the fast monetary tightening in the U.S. seems to have a bigger effect on Korea. Uh, Seoul shares, meanwhile, closed higher on Tuesday, ending a three-day losing streak. The cost gained 0.26% or 6.34 points to 2,410.02. Yeah, again, I mean, uh, there's speculations that the uh, the U.S. Fed is going to continue to raise its interest rate, not just once, but maybe two more times. Uh, we're looking at a giant state this mm -hmm. time, a 75 basis points. Uh, could it be 50 basis points next time around and then a 25 basis points? Uh, we'll have to see. But the higher it goes, I mean, the, the BOK they're not going to be able to catch up. I, I, you know, even if the BO, they've already raised the uh, the interest rate again at 25 basis points not too long ago. We're already going to probably see a reversal uh, come later this month here. Uh, but uh, man, boy, the, the Korean one really sinking here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go into other news this time. The Seoul Defense Dialogue. This is an annual international security forum hosted by South Korea's Defense Ministry. Uh, that kicked off today. Uh, security experts from over 50 countries took part in the session to discuss matters on North Korean denuclearization and other security challenges. Uh, Chi, let, let's get the details of this. Sure. So the three-day Vice Ministerial Seoul Defense Dialogue, or SDD, which marks its, its 10th anniversary this year, kicked off in central Seoul under the theme of how to address uh, complex security challenges, fostering international solidarity. Now, the Seoul Security Dialogue is a high-level multilateral security dialogue in the defense field, and it was launched in 2012. Uh, it aims to contribute to peace on the Korean Peninsula and promote security cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. Now, the first fully in-person SDD session since 2019 uh, brought together senior defense officials and civilian experts from 54 countries, the United Nations, European Union, and North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization. And on the first day of the forum, the Space Security Working Group was launched as a new SDD gathering to discuss global cooperation and promoting security in the strategically crucial domain, uh, according to the ministry. And the margins on the margins of the SDD, uh, Seoul's Vice Defense Minister Shin bom Char plans to host a meeting with his counterparts from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations to discuss mid- and long-term plans for bilateral defense cooperation. And on Wednesday, which is tomorrow, uh, Defense Minister Shin is set to hold a series of meetings with three Asia-Pacific partner countries, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, to discuss cooperation and maintaining solidarity in the protection of quote-unquote values and norms. Uh, and the opening ceremony of the forum is also scheduled for tomorrow morning. Now, South Korean Defense Minister Lee jong sup uh, will deliver opening remarks and National Security Advisor Kim sung han and the Netherlands Defense Minister Kasa Olongren will deliver keynote addresses. 
The forum consists of three key plenary sessions on cooperation in promoting North Korea's denuclearization as well as rebuilding trust within the Indo-Pacific region and the role of the military in hybrid warfare uh, involving both conventional and unconventional war instruments. And there are also four special sessions that have been arranged to discuss international peacekeeping operations, the fight against disinformation, uh, defense technologies for military modernization, and defense acquisition efforts. Uh, if you're interested, these key sessions are live streamed on YouTube with simultaneous interpretation. So you can look at that if you're interested. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, all the more important because I think there was some report coming out from the United States that uh, North Korea right now. Now they're really not only ramping up their nuclear capabilities, but uh, also their uh, cyber warfare and uh, even chemical warfare is uh, what they're saying. So a lot of discussion needed on that front. Uh, but on the occasion of the SDC, SDD forum, uh, South Korea and Japan are scheduled to hold senior level bilateral defense talks on Wednesday. Uh, this to discuss security cooperation, a number of thorny issues, however, uh, also likely to come up as well. So uh, tell us more about this. Yes, so Shin Bum Chol, South Korea's Vice Defense Minister, and Masami Oka, Japan's Vice Defense Minister for International Affairs, are to hold a bilateral meeting tomorrow on the sidelines of the Seoul Defense Dialogue. It's going to be the first meeting at this level since 2016, so the first time in six years. The two sides, according to Seoul's Defense Ministry on Monday, are expected to seek strengthened security cooperation amid North Korea's growing military threat. But uh, it's probably not only going to be about cooperation on the Korean Peninsula, as the two neighboring nations have a number of unresolved pending issues at hand, mainly historically, uh, which to some extent are pretty much linked to defense issues as well. Now, one topic expected to be discussed is a controversial um, invitation by Tokyo for the South Korean mm. Navy to attend Japan's International Fleet Review mm. in November. And this year marks the 70th anniversary of the the founding of Japan's maritime self-defense force. So what's controversial about this is uh, that the event usually features the hoisting mm -hmm. of the rising sun flag on Japanese vessels. This flag in South Korea as well as China symbolizes Japan's imperial aggression and war crimes as it had been used by the Japanese military during the Second World War. Uh, the South Korean government is reportedly reviewing its attendance. Uh, back in 2018, Seoul did not accept the invitation as Tokyo refused the South Korean government's request to not hoist the rising sun flag. And in 2019, uh, Seoul was not even invited because the relations were really bad during yeah, that time. Yeah, uh, I mean, oh my goodness. Can you imagine uh, Japan and South Korean Navy ships going hand in hand with the rising sun flag being hoisted? Um, I don't know. It doesn't I, make sense. No. Uh, but you see, that, that's the thing that upsets me is because I, I don't, we go back to the whole idea where Japan really never learned from their past mistakes, right? Uh, you don't see like Germany still waving their, you know, Nazi swastika or anything mm. like that. But the rising sun flag, oh, it's okay. No, it's not. Uh, well, well, we'll see what uh, the, the South Korean government uh, decides to do here. Uh, what else is going to be, uh, could be discussed there? Um, the normalization of Jisamia mm. could also be on the table, which is the G General Security of Military Information Agreement, an intelligence sharing pact between Seoul and Tokyo, uh, where the two sides share information regarding North Korea. Now, the pact, which exists since 2016, has to be renewed every year, but due to deteriorating ties between the two sides, there were once talks about South Korea's withdrawal uh, and uh, now currently a termination has just been suspended so it's not been normalized but uh uh, there was a time when the U.S. kind of made South Korea at least uh, suspend the termination yeah, for yeah. a while. Uh, and uh, there were a number of incidents uh, that led to stalled Jisamia. Uh, for instance, the trade retaliation from Japan in 2019. And then also a big incident in 2018, uh, the so-called radar lock on Rao. That's linked to an incident between a South Korean destroyer that was looking for a North Korean ship. Yeah. And a Japanese aircraft was involved. 
involved. I'm not going to go into the details of that uh, discussion. Uh, but according to an official, the talks are expected to last 20 or 30 minutes uh, tomorrow. So it's not going to be a long discussion. Uh, so maybe they won't be able to talk about all of these pending issues. Yeah, uh, that's the other thing. that I, I think with the Japanese side, what they're saying when we're talking about uh, the invitation for South Korea to take part in the, uh, the, the fleet review, they're saying that, look, uh, you know, we don't... This Now, this is the Japanese side. Some of the Japanese side, they're saying, we shouldn't invite South Korea because we haven't resolved this whole issue with the radar lock-on, right? Uh, but the bigger thing for us is, again, the rising sun flag. Let, let's share this uh, picture uh, what, what's next to the, the rising sun flag here? Oh, oh, oh th that's the German Nazi swastika. Uh, it is. Why is it next to each other? Oh, uh, geez, I don't know. Maybe uh, symbolizing the same thing here. Uh, that could be it. But I just don't understand why there's Again, people have banned the use of the swastika. In Germany, it's illegal to have the swastika, right? I mean, you, you kind of see it from like the far right wingers and things like that. Uh, but in, in Japan, I, I just feel like they have a different idea over the, over the, uh, the rising sun flag. And I think uh, it's also our job to uh, educate people abroad because there are also a lot of like like Western countries, uh, people from like the Western countries who think this is like a cool thing. It like symbolizes Japanese martial arts or something like that. And they come out with the the rising sun uh, forehead band and they do all these things. It upsets me. Mm. And Japan's excuse is that it's kind of um, a rule by law that they have to hoist the flag at such events. I, so you're from Germany. Yeah. Like, I'm, maybe you're really young, but I mean, you don't see people going around no. going, you know, we're proud of our history and uh, It's things. really a taboo. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It really is. Uh, thank you. Yang Gurum says it's a disgusting flags. Uh, you put an S in it. The, yeah, the, both of them are very dis It's equally disgusting, uh, in my opinion. Thank you very much for the pictures for that. Uh, in the meantime, South Korea's special representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs uh, leaving for Tokyo to hold talks with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts over security issues. Uh, let's hear more on this, Chidi. Sure. So South Korea's top nuclear envoy, Kim Gon, headed to Japan today for consultations with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Sung Kim and Takihiro uh, Funakoshi, on North Korea and other issues shared uh, of shared concerns. Now, the special representatives also plan to have a series of bilateral meetings there. And Seoul's foreign ministry said the officials are expected to assess the security situation on the Korean peninsula and discuss the issue of North Korea's denuclearization. Now, in a separate uh, press release, the State Department said the three sides will discuss a broad range of issues, including our continued joint efforts to achieve the complete denuclearization of the Korean peninsula. Uh, it added that Sung Kim will stress the U.S. commitment to a dialogue, even while he uh, we will take all necessary action to address the threat Pyongyang poses to the United States and our allies. Now, the envoys held their previous group meeting on the Indonesian resort island of Bali in July, and the national security advisors of the regional powers had a meeting in Hawaii last week. Now, the three allies will reportedly discuss ways to promote the quote-unquote bold initiative or the audacious initiative of the Yoon suk administration. And the South Korean government said, while the framework of the initiative has been created, the specifics have to be discussed in advance regarding methods of cooperation in the initial stage, uh, just in case North Korea decides to come to the negotiation table in the future. And that's the unfortunate thing, I think, is there are so many things that uh, South Korea and Japan can really work work together on and cooperate on, whether it be North Korea related issue, whether it be economy, right? If I mean, the two countries are all good, I think economically, I mean, there's so many win-win situations that could come out from it, but there's always something that is getting in the way of uh, the two countries there, whether it be the historical, it's the historical issues that's uh, unfortunately not being solved at this time. But Guys, will South Korea-Japan ties uh, eventually pan out in a positive direction? Uh, also, how is the situation being assessed by uh, experts and uh, others? Uh, let's start off with you, Soa. Well, first off, I think it is a really positive sign to see a meeting happening at this level because even if it's just for the sake of talks, even that did not happen for... I don't know, six years. And uh, we're not expecting extremely in-depph discussions here. Uh, that even has been mentioned by an 
expert or rather an official at the Defense Ministry on anonymity when speaking to a local uh, newspaper. The official said, rather than having an in-depth discussion, the meeting will serve as an opportunity for Seoul and Tokyo to commit to enhancing defense and security cooperation. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's just going to be a 20 to 30 minute yeah. talk. So it's I don't think that uh, this meeting will be so significant in uh, future uh, ties. But I think what's really important is the decisions that come after the meeting, for instance, whether Japan will decide to use the raising flag again during that um, event uh, in November and whether South Korean President Yoon seok yeol will actually accept the invitation, uh, regardless of maybe the flag, which is probably not going to happen, but you never know because the current administration is trying to improve ties uh, with Japan. So I think the upcoming weeks and months are uh, very important. And then also what's going to play a big role uh, in the ties is uh, we just heard today that um, the government has made some remarks uh, regarding a forced uh, labor victims compensation issue uh, and uh, they uh, there was a Japanese uh, media uh, that uh, said that South Korea's government is going to uh, resolve the issue um, at the earliest uh, of early next month. but South Korea yeah, is yeah, going yeah, to yeah. resolve the issue. Oh, geez. Mm, so the South Korean government first off said that they do not have a timeline in solving the issue. And uh, we know it's actually a court issue, right? W- where the government yeah, does yeah. not really uh, intervene. But uh, Japan makes it kind of sound as if Seoul's uh, government will intervene in that. Now, also what uh, the foreign ministry said is that they uh, understand that the victims want compensation and an apologies from Japanese companies and that they don't want the government to step in to compensate them. This, according to a foreign ministry official in a me- um, uh, official meeting with the press uh, on Monday evening after he had also uh, met with the victims. So, yes, and uh, the consensus is that they won't use the government budget to do this, but there could be other third-party organizations that could uh, be involved in this issue. I wonder which third-party organization could get involved with this if mm-hmm. uh, the government uh, isn't going to be using our tax money. See, that that's the very difficult thing, and that is it's not just uh, the South Korean government and the Japanese government and the Japanese companies involved with this lawsuit, but it's also the victims Right, and the South Korean public's also watching very carefully. And so, I, I remember one of the, uh, the the offer was something like, like you said, like the South Korean government will pay for the compensation first, and then maybe yeah. receive it later on from the company. I, they're not going to give you the money. I, there's there's no way. And so, and at the same time, the citizens were saying, if the South Korean government is paying the the what is it the victims of forced labor that's like saying it was south korea's fault and they're paying for it mm. while it's not i mean the target is on the the, the japanese companies right that they, they just didn't you know pay out the other uh, victims here so i it's it's really tough it's really tough uh before i go any further uh gee what about yourself uh, will south korea japan ties eventually pan out in a positive direction well, that is the uh, direction that we should head toward. Definitely. And, yeah. yeah. Other than the uh, major biggest challenge uh, between the two countries, which is the compensation issue for the uh, forced laborers. Uh, recently, um, South Korean and Japanese experts held a meeting where they emphasized that uh, the shuttle diplomacy between the two leaders must, re- must be resumed and that the summit should be held as quickly as possible. And in terms of economic and uh, security cooperation between the t- countries. I remember um, how the uh, how Japan, the Japanese government, imposed expert restrictions on South Korea in July 2019, and experts urged uh, the Japanese government to lift that as soon as possible to boost economic uh, cooperation between the countries. And they also suggested that uh, the leaders of the two countries must show leadership by persuading the people uh, that Korea and Japan are partners and not enemies, and that we share many interests and values in the international community. And also regarding uh, the matter of compensating for the forced laborers, uh, one uh, a former National Assembly speaker, Muni Sang, reiterated that it's uh, s- similar to what Soa said, but the compensation for victims should be provided through voluntary funds of both Korean and Japanese companies as a solution to the matter. That's what he said. 
I don't, I don't think a South Korean company should get involved with this. And that's just the thing, right? And this is why it's so difficult because there's so many parties involved. But both governments need to remember that the most important person, uh, I guess the part of all this involved are the victims. Mm. The victims need to be happy with whatever the result comes out. And uh, mm. I've been mentioning this before. The victims, I'm not speaking for every victim, but uh, most victims wouldn't want a sincere apology. It's not only about the compensation. So they would rather have, I, again, I'm not speaking for everyone, but they would rather have a sincere apology from the companies and Japan than have just compensation from the South Korean government, for instance. Yeah, but at the same time, I think this mm. is a little bit different with like the uh, forced sex slaves mm. uh, in that... Again, uh, they worked, right? right so, like, right. They, they, so these forced workers, they worked. So, not only they need an apology too. I think that's just a given, and they need to be compensated uh, with this, with the with the uh, forced slave, sex slavery issue. With, I mean, there was never a, a, pop, a proper apology uh, in, in regards to that, but. I just don't want this to be another 2015 deal uh, that the two governments had before mm. where it kind of left out the victims, right? Who were the most important mm. uh, aspect of all this. Uh, but I, I'm just really... Ho- for our listeners out there, don't get me wrong. It, it almost sounds like as if I'm not rooting for the two countries to be friendly and have really good ties. I don't. I really want them to have really good ties. But it's unfortunate uh, when Japan refuses uh, to acknowledge their past mistakes. And again, the use of the, the rising sun flag is another very good example of uh, not fixing what's wrong in the past. So uh, this is why the, I, I've said this many, many times. For the UN administration, this is going to be one of the toughest task at hand and so we'll have to see uh what goes on and it's apparently everything that i'm saying right now has turned the air really bad because the uh, <laughs> the air purifier is just acting up uh guys we're gonna move on to our last piece of uh issue that uh, we're gonna cover on the day here uh, we've been updating all of our listeners in regards to the super typhoon hymnum nor uh there was a lot of concerns in re- regards to this uh, the weather now really fits that phrase, right? The storm comes after the calm, uh, calm. but the storm did leave casualties, unfortunately, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, still people missing. So uh, what, what's the latest on this? Right. Uh, while Typhoon Hinnam Noor has departed South Korea in waters near Ulsan in the country's south, it has so far left two people dead and 10 unaccounted for, uh, according to the KDCA this Tuesday. And uh, this afternoon, we heard of an additional eight people that have been reported missing in the southeastern city of Pohang in Gyeongsangbuk-do province. They were all said to have gone to their parking lots to get their cars out. Uh, according to Pohang city officials, as of around 9 a.m., seven people were uh, were out of contact after they entered a submerged underground parking Jeez. garage in an apartment around 6.30 a.m. They were reportedly told to move their cars through an announcement by the apartment managers. I think this part is really what's sad about it. Yeah, they, yeah. they might have not even went uh, to um, take care of their cars. And uh, another woman in her 60s also remains missing since entering another underground parking lot of a separate apartment building in Po. Now, rescuers were carrying out operations to drain the garage and search for the missing people. Uh, a man in his 20s reported, uh, mis- is reported missing in Ulsan, and two women were earlier killed in the aftermath of the typhoon. Uh, in Pohang, uh, one woman was uh, swept away by torrential water while trying to evacuate, and in Gyeongju, one woman was found uh, buried in a collapsed house. And there were also damages to uh, constructions as well and uh, there were also some uh, more than 20,000 people that were affected by the electricity outages and then there were more than 3,400 people that had to evacuate because they were in risky areas. Uh, There were also flights cancelled, 251 in fact, but uh, those were all, again, the flights are all operating as of today. Uh, 
it's it's one of those things where like just torrential rain is one thing that's dangerous as well but with typhoon just comes really really strong wind and i think we were talking about this uh the other day uh Sumin was explaining to us uh the wind speeds uh it was it was more than 50 meters per second which could actually even damage buildings and this is an ex another example i remember some people were basically saying like oh the hemnam nor wasn't that bad not bad two people are dead and uh there's 10 people missing uh it's Goodness. Uh, we also uh, heard from the weather agency reporting that the super typhoon Himnam Noor uh, moved out of the country towards the EC this morning, which was really surprising because uh, it rained a bit in the morning. Like last night here in Seoul, uh, it rained a lot. Mm -hmm. It ha rained hard at, at nighttime and like early mornings. It didn't matter for us that much. Uh, and then it just turned absolutely beautiful by the afternoon, which was really weird. But uh, nevertheless, uh, let's t hear more about uh, how this uh, typhoon moved out. Jihee, you have more on this. Right. So this year's 11th typhoon moved off the southeastern coastal city of Ulsan, which is 307 kilometers southeast of Seoul, toward the East Sea at 7, uh, 10 a.m. after making landfall near the southern city of Goje at 4.50 a.m., according to the Korea Meteorological Administration. Now, with an atmospheric pressure of 955, Five hectopascals at its center and maximum wind speed of 40 kilometers per second as of 6 a.m. The intensity of uh, Typhoon Hinnam Noor was similar to that of Bemi, which occurred in 2003 and was one of the most devastating typhoons uh, in South Korea. Now, Hinnam Noor is forecast to move upward to reach waters 100, and, uh, 100 kilometers northeast of Ulleung Island at it reached Ulleung Island at noon and 560 kilometers kilometers north uh, east of the island at 6 p.m., which was about 30 minutes ago, to further proceed northeast toward Japan's Sap Sapo uh, Sapporo at midnight. And as of 9 a.m., uh, Hinnam Nor had been heading northeast at a speed of 62 kilometers per hour in waters 110 kilometers southwest of Ulleung Island. And uh, Typhoon Hinnam Nor, meanwhile, earlier today passed Japan's southwestern main island of Kyushu, bringing torrential rain and strong winds to the area before moving northward through the Sea of Japan. Now, Kyushu has so far experienced uh, widespread power outages and disruption in transportation services, and the typhoon left two dead in that region. I'm going to make a quick correction on there. The EC is what it is. The EC is where it moved towards. Uh, let's uh, talk a little a bit more about the sheer size of this uh, typhoon which uh, you know we're expecting this to be like again like the most powerful typhoon that we've ever seen and we we're even talking about this yesterday how it was kind of be like uh, the sheer size of like Meimi back in 2003, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, Chi just uh, talked about. But it wasn't as powerful, but we can't ignore the fact, again, it did lead to fatalities and casualties and still people missing right now. But it does kind of uh, bring about some curiosity as to why it turned out a little bit different. Uh, the outcome of the typhoon turned out a little bit more different than what we had expected. Uh, so uh, you have more on this. Right. So first of all, it exited the country faster than we expected, which has got to do with the fewer impacts or damages that many of us uh, have expected. According to the nation's weather agency, Hinnam Nor made landfall at 4.50 a.m. in uh, near Goje in Gyeongsangnam-do province, uh, with winds blowing at 145 to 215 kilometers per hour at the shores of Jeollanam-do province's south coast and Gyeongsangnam-do coast areas. Uh, so this is around an hour earlier than predictions made before that said the landfall is predicted to take place around 6 a.m. An official at the Korea Meteorological Administration said the typhoon was much larger than the size of the Korean Peninsula and the speed was very volatile, yeah. which explains why it landed faster than expected. However, the official added, if we analyze the total barometer in East Asia, the error range of one hour in the travel speed is within uh, normality of nature, is how he described it. Now, what's helped in this different scenario is that to be a high pressure that was located in the region, which has helped the typhoon's path move slightly further to the east, and with that, shorten its time on the Korean Peninsula. So the course basically changed thanks to the high pressure. And uh, let me also refer to another expert's explanation during an interview with a local media outlet who tried to answer why the impact of the typhoon was not as bad as uh, we might have thought, and why it didn't affect the entire country. Now, earlier forecasts said, 
Imnamnor is a very big typhoon with a radius of 400 kilometers, meaning it can carry strong winds and heavy rain in almost the entire country. Uh, expert, uh, the expert said, first off, for some people it did affect them bad, yeah. as we have been mentioning, like in the south. So we should not underrate the impacts. But the reason for why it didn't affect all areas as much is uh, because something that's called hot tower, he described. I'm not going to go into the very details, mm. but I'm trying to simplify this. There is something that's called the hot tower inside the typhoon, and it makes up, up around 3% of the entire size. And that's the part that's in charge of the strong developing winds. Yeah. So even if Hinnam nor its was even larger than the Korean Peninsula, the area uh, hit hard was that's been affected by the so-called hot tower that makes up yeah. 3%. So this uh, can describe why not the entire nation has been affected. Look, the thing is, uh, we've been seeing some really volatile uh, rainy seasons over the past few years. Uh, we've seen a torrential rain, a monsoon season that lasted like months uh, a few years back. And we saw the torrential rain recently here in the Seoul and the surrounding areas. We saw this massive typhoon. Uh, the possibility of this happening every year is pretty high, which which a lot of the experts are saying. So they're saying there is a need to come up with fundamental countermeasures to manage the habitual flooding in vulnerable areas. Uh, Chihi, finish us off with this. Right. So the Korea Research Institute for Human Settlements published a report titled Urban Flood Prevention Measures in the Era of Climate Crisis, uh, Lessons from Heavy Rain in the Metropolitan Area in 2022. This was published today, uh, where the need to provide countermeasures to future habitual heavy rain has been highlighted. Now, according to the report, the torrential rain that fell in the metropolitan area on the 8th of last month uh, uh, fell by 141.5 millimeters per hour. And uh, within 24 hours, about 381.5 millimeters fell. And following the incident, uh, we saw eight uh, dead and some 10,000 vehicles were submerged. And the report analyzed basically that the localized heavy rains uh, exceeding the existing disaster prevention performance targets are uh, highly likely to fall in the future again because of abnormal climate conditions. And the report criticized that the current laws and regulations are insufficient to prepare for the change in the weather conditions that we're going to see in the future. So the settlements, the Korea Research Institutes, suggested that active investment is needed, such as strengthening the management of these uh, flooding areas, including Gangnam Station, as well as installing large-scale rainwater storage and drainage facilities uh, that can raise the disaster prevention performance target to at least 100 millimeters per hour in uh, areas prone to flooding. And the institution also emphasized the need to improve laws and systems, uh, such as making it mandatory to install underground flood prevention facilities as well. Yeah, I saw the uh, the underground, uh, f what is it, uh, drainage facility in the Mokdong area. It's massive. Mm. Uh, that's what Gangnam area really needs because we're seeing this. I mean, we're seeing this all the time, right? Uh, nevertheless, guys thank you very much for coming in today stay safe and we'll see you guys again see you you can listen to korea now with me sj lee by downloading the arirang radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com